Okay, so uh, welcome to all for one more session of uh, the Matemaira Corana 2 uh, uh, scientific meeting in honor of Gilberto uh, Cabral's 80th birthday. And uh, today I have the honor of, uh, of uh, announcing the, our speaker of today, that is uh, David Sozan from the uh, Institute de Mechanique Celeste, Calcul des Ephemerides, uh, Paris. Uh, David has uh, I think, in one, more than one occasion, uh, for sure. The previous Matemaira Corana he attended, and uh, and it was, I was glad to see that in his um, abstract, the abstract to his talk, he he mentioned that uh, the time he spent here uh, it was nice. Uh, you know, the the length of the event allowed him to do some interesting work, and I think today we we see uh, an extension of that after uh, a few years, right? Uh, so, David will speak uh, on uh, attracted by an elliptic fixed point. Uh, very interesting topic, and uh, I'll pass to you, David, uh, uh, the word now. Have a good talk. Um, and now we'll ask uh, everybody to turn off cameras and uh, microphones to facilitate the connection. So, have a good talk, David. Thank you, Eduardo. And well, it's my pleasure to thank all the organizers. I am absolutely delighted to participate to this virtual event honoring Edoberto, who encounter and homenage a Edoberto. So, since there is attracted in my title, let me dwell a little bit on this word attractive. Um, I'm sure you all agree that Hidoberto's personality is stunningly attractive. But today, the subject of my talk are some mathematical objects which usually are not so attractive. Indeed, um, non-resonant elliptic fixed points of symplectomorphisms. This is the, the subject. So here is the, the terminology, which is quite uh, usual. So when you have um, a fixed point, like you can put it at the origin for a symplectic diffeomorphism, let's say in R2n, is the standard symplectic structure. Uh, we call T the map. So we say that the fixed point is elliptic with frequency vector omega if the linear part, dt of zero, the linear part is conjugate to this product of rotations. You see, we view the phase space R2n as a, pro, a Cartesian product of n copies of R2. And these are my notations. Our omega 1, our omega 2 are just rigid rotations with rotation number um, omega 1, omega 2, etc. That means that um, if omega 1 is periodic, for instance, is rational, then the corresponding rotation is periodic with the period equal to the denominator. So, this is an elliptic fixed point, and we say it is non-resonant if, moreover, uh, this scalar product uh, with integers, that is um, uh, uh, linear combination with integer uh, coefficients, are never integer when uh, k is non-zero. So the resonant case is indeed very different. For instance, it's quite easy to cook up a special example of a symplectomorphism in which uh, many points are attracted by the fixed point. And uh, so you take this Hamiltonian function, y times x squared plus x, y squared. This is in one degree of freedom and you consider the flow at time one. So you have at the origin for the vector field uh, a singular point and the linear part vanishes. So the, the linear part of the map is identity. So this is absolutely resonant. And as you know, in that case, the linear part doesn't tell you much about the dynamics. So then indeed, the nonlinear dynamics in this case has a whole half axis attracted in positive time 
by um, the origin. So this is very special because it's so resonant. We are interested in non-resonant elliptic fixed points in this uh, context. So the question is, is it possible to find a symplectomorphism with a non-resonant elliptic fixed point and at least one non-trivial orbit which converges to the fixed point in forward time? So this is the question, and if I ask it, it's because, yes, the answer is yes. And we have uh, a paper with um, uh, Bassam Fayad and Jean-Pierre Marco to that effect. So it was published last year in this um, uh, special volume in honor of Jean-Christophe Yoko's. So we have a theorem uh, giving examples, which are the first known examples of symplectomorphisms having um, symplectomorphisms of R6, so three degrees of freedom if you, if you want, but they are not Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And um, the, um, these examples are synfinity, not analytic. And immediately I can say one thing, if you have an orbit converging in forward time to the fixed point, then in, if you reverse time, this means that the origin is Lyapunov unstable for the reverse dynamics. Indeed, you can you leave any uh, fixed, um, any small neighborhood of the origin uh, by choosing a point on the orbit, and then in, you you go out of that neighborhood. So um, let's put this um, result of ours in the context of, let's say, Arnold diffusion. So Arnold diffusion in this broad definition, and we say that uh, if a system, symplectic, map, or Hamiltonian system has a non-resonant elliptic fixed point, or maybe it's close to integrable and you have an external parameter, it's a perturbation parameter, then in those cases, the formal perturbation theory seems to predict that the action variables cannot vary much. Action variables meaning the distance to the fixed point or the action if you are perturbing um, an integrable system in action angle variables. So there is a formal perturbation theory which seems to say that nothing will happen, but in fact we know that something may happen except in low dimension because of KM theory. In low dimension with appropriate non-degeneracy assumptions, uh, there will be perpetual stability of action variables due to the abundance of KAM curves or KAM tori. Um, so usually we, what is called Arnold diffusion is that possibility for some orbits to have their action variables drifting away from their initial values. And for that, you, you need not to be not in the lowest dimension. So um, let me speak a little bit about the lowest dimension first. So when n is one, we are in R2, the linear part in, um, in uh, polar coordinate is like this. And the very important thing in that case is the Birkhoff normal form, which means that you can find uh, for any order n, a polynomial change of coordinates, which brings the map, the nonlinear map to that form in which the, um, uh, the radius r doesn't change up to order n plus one, and the angle is uh, incremented by omega, which is the frequency at the origin, plus something which does depend on the radius. And these are the, the Birkhoff invariants. So if we have some torsion, so typically torsion would be would mean a1 non-zero, but in, in fact, according to Moser's, Moser's results and KM theory, uh, if you have a non-zero Birkhoff normal form, then KM theory will hold. There will be an accumulation by invariant quasi-periodic smooth curves uh, at the origin. And there is also a beautiful theorem by Michel Hermann, last geometric theorem by Hermann, which says that if omega is diophantine, even if there is no torsion, again, we will have this situation which forces Lyapunov stability. So for n equal one, in all these cases, you have Lyapunov stability. Now, uh, about the history of the subject, um, Anosov-Katok in 1960 give examples of ergodic 
symplectomorphisms of the disk in which you have Lyapunov instability, but you don't have one single orbit conver converging to the origin in backward or forward time. Um, with uh, two degrees of freedom or more, we have uh, Duadi, Raphael Duadi's papers and the one with Le Calvez about Lyapunov inst instability with arbitrary non-degenerate Birkhoff normal form. So uh, despite the, the predictions of this Birkhoff normal form, which seems to say that, well, after uh, the appropriate change of coordinate, it doesn't move at all, but still they find uh, a Lyapunov unstable uh, fixed point in suitable examples, but in their cases, there is again no orbit converging to the origin. And um, so we have this paper with Bassam Fayad and Jean-Pierre Marco. Uh, and after our um, collaboration was uh, completed, Bassam Fayad found another uh, idea and he has this preprint, very recent, about examples of Yapunov instability, analytic examples, analytic Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, uh, flows of Hamiltonian systems. And uh, moreover, in, in his cases, the Birkhoff normal form is divergent. So it's quite fascinating. So for today, I will try to describe these examples from our joint paper. They have Birkhoff normal form reduced to zero. They require at least three degrees of freedom for some reason. We don't know how to do it in R4. We can, uh, and in, maybe in R2, it's just impossible. We don't know. Even in such a degenerate case, we don't know. In R4, we just could not manage. So we, our example is for R6 or higher dimension. Our examples are not analytic, contrarily to Bassam's recent example, but they are Gevre, and I will try to comment on that. And they all rely on Hermann synchronized diffusion mechanism. So I will try to explain what Hermann synchronized diffusion mechanism is. Is it okay so far? Can you hear me? Because I, abso I have absolutely no feedback. I can't even see you. Yeah, we I can hope... hear you. Good. Just tell me if something is wrong. Well, if, if I can't hear you, it will be difficult for you to communicate, but okay. It's perfect, perfect David. Thank you. I'm reassured. <sighs> so I want to comment about this example in our joint paper. But before giving mathematical details. Let me say something. The construction of Gevre examples of unstable Hamiltonian or exact symplectic systems is a line of research that had started in collaboration with Michel Hermann and Jean-Pierre Marco as early as 1999, about one year before uh, Michel Hermann's untimely death. And so for me, it's, it's a long story and it's, uh, I would say, um, a big portion of my research activity. Uh, indeed, I mean, look at these papers that we have written with Jean-Pierre. Uh, so there was one, in, it was published only in 2003, but it, it had started four years before. Um, and uh, so based on Michel Hermann's ideas, and there was another one the next year, and then much later, but a big paper in the more of the American Mathematical Society. And, and, and then there was one paper with Bassam and this paper that I am currently uh, commenting. So you see, I have worked on these ideas for a certain amount of time. And for me, the early stage of that story is associated with good memories of Hidoberto in Recife, because Hidoberto uh, had invited me as early as 2003, I think it was the first time, to lecture on the results that had been obtained at that time. And then there was the first edition of Mate Mayra Corana in 2005, and Jean-Pierre was here too, and together for several weeks we could discuss our results with colleagues, pursue our investigations and, and go toward the next paper in the, in the list and all that in a, in a really, really nice environment. 
I have proof of that. Uh, uh, here is a photographical proof. You see how Idubertu um, was keen to um, uh, introduce me to Brazilian culture, to the exotic fruits, uh, exotic beverages. Uh, good moments indeed in Recife and in the forest and deeper in the forest and uh, also mathematical discussions with the Berto, uh, passionate discussion as you can imagine, even working late at night. And with good friends, Jean-Pierre Mar Marco was here, as I mentioned. And really we had a very good time and these are very, very nice memories for me. So I'm all the more uh, delighted to, to participate to that event. Event. So um, these papers are all about Gevre examples of instability based on what we call Hermann synchronized diffusion mechanism. So this allowed us to give examples of um, drifting orbits. This was typically, I mean, for a near integrable system in the Gevre category, I mean, um, for analytic systems. Not only we have KM theory, but we have Nekoroshev theory, which says that uh, indeed, if action moves, if actions move, they will move very slowly because it needs an exponentially long time before you, you move by a noticeable uh, quantity. So that was Hermann's idea to bring Nekoroshev theory in the Gevre context and then to, to construct examples. And we had other beautiful examples with uh, Jean-Pierre containing wandering domains, random walks. Um, and uh, these wandering domains in this big paper, we could even make them as large as possible because again, Nekoroshev theory in the Gevre case will force these wandering domains to be exponentially small. So, but can we indeed find domains which are that of that size, and that was this long paper. Uh, it was completed uh, well before 2019, you know, memoirs have such a backlog. And as early as 2010, I could participate to Aracaju, another encontro and homenaging a Aidubertu. And um, that was very nice to Aracaju. And I remember I talked about this uh, project, which was not completed at that time. Okay, uh, today we focus on the last of the list, attracted by an elliptic fixed point. Uh, let me first comment about the Gevre regularity. So this is um, regularity. I mean, we are speaking of um, C infinity functions and um, Let's say you are in R two n variables, maybe two n variables, and among them there will be some functions which satisfy bounds for their derivatives. So, if all the partial derivatives are bounded by factorial l power alpha, where l is the order of the partial derivative, then you say that the function is Gevre alpha. And of course, if your function is analytic, real analytic, then you know that the derivatives according to Cauchy inequalities are bounded by factorial L. So factorial L power alpha with alpha larger than one, this is a generalization. This is the Gevre alpha case. And in fact, conversely, uh, Gevre one exactly means analyticity. But Gevre alpha with alpha larger than one is definitely not analytic, not quasi-analytic because there exist Gevre alpha functions with compact support if alpha is larger than one. And this is the big difference that we can use to cook up examples. So you fix some capital L, I don't go into the details, but just, well, L is one over M if you wish, so that this space, Gevre alpha L will be a Banach algebra. The same way with um, analytic function, when you fix in advance the, max, the strip, the minimum strip 
of um, minimum width of a complex strip to which the function should extend. You know, if you want um, Banach space of holomorphic functions, you you say, okay, I take my function in a real domain, and I suppose there is a, a uniform neighborhood neighborhood in the complex domain in which the function extends holomorphically, and then you can get um, a Banach space. So this is why we need this auxiliary parameter L, and it's a Banach algebra, meaning the product of Jodre alpha function is under control. There are de derivatives also, but well, this is almost tautological. You have Jodre Cauchy inequalities because by definition, if a function is Jodre, you control well its derivatives. Composition of Jodre alpha maps is under control. The flow of a Jodre vector field is a Jodre map. In particular, the flow of a Jevre alpha Hamiltonian system is made of Jevre alpha symplectomorphisms. So this is how we will produce our maps. So let me denote by um, U alpha L, the set of all Jevre alpha L symplectic diffeomorphisms in dimension six, fixing the origin and C infinity tangent to identity at the origin. This is because you see, I want to produce, I want to produce a symplectomorphism T. And the linear part should be should be S omega, uh, the rigid rotation with frequency vector omega. So it, it will be of that form. Psi composed with S, where psi belongs to this um, set um, U alpha L. So we are interested in those psi, which are which fix the original. The linear part is identity, so that the linear part of T will be just S omega, uh, symplectic. And this, again, I don't give any technical detail. This is a complete metric space. You can define a distance, which is, as you can see, invariant by translation. So this is not quite a norm. It's the, the distance to the zero map, if you wish. So, uh, this is the framework, the Jevre set of uh, symplectic diffeomorphisms. And here is the theorem uh, with the technical details. So, you fix alpha larger than one, not analytic, L positive. You fix gamma positive, uh, and you can find a non resonant vector in, let's say, in three dimensions, omega a point, an initial condition in the phase space, and a diffeomorphism psi belonging to that space, so that you can use T uh, equal to psi composed with S omega, and my diffeomorphism psi, I can even take it arbitrarily close to identity. So this was not required a priori, but well, in a sense, it's also perturbative. Although um, we have no uh, quantitative estimates in our paper with respect to gamma. So for arbitrarily small gamma, we can take psi arbitrarily close to, to identity, gamma close to identity. And so we, we obtain this um, dynamical system, discrete dynamical system, which with at least one non-trivial orbit going to the origin, although the origin is a non-resonant elliptic fixed point. These will be obtained as limits of some Cauchy sequences. So it's a, an inductive construction. We construct frequencies omega n, uh, initial conditions which go farther and closer and closer to the origin, and, and systems will depend on, on psi n. Um, and uh, let me draw your attention to that fact. Each omega n will be resonant and it's super resonant it will be rash with rational components and the denominators will be a multiples one of the other so each omega n will be very very resonant but in the limit omega will be non-resonant but it will be not diophantine at all it will be super levillian so each omega n will be um, rational and this will help us to to have these synchronized attraction scheme for the dynamical system at step n. At step n, we will deal with psi n composed with s omega n. So 
uh, I don't want to be too technical. Uh, let me say that we need a fine synchronization between the three rational components of the frequency vector. So because uh, frequency vector rational means that S omega n is periodic. So the points come back to their initial position after a certain amount of time. Of course, the period gets higher and higher when n increases. Uh, but we will take advantage of that. We will arrange things so that psi n is almost inactive most of the time on a long portion of the orbit of Zn. So we choose psi n, we choose Zn. So Zn will travel along with the dynamical system, will travel close to the origin, closer and closer when n increases. But in fact, it will not travel in a uniform way, not at all. I mean, most of the time, psi n does nothing. So Zn just undergoes this rotation, S omega n. But the rotation is periodic, and from time to time, there is a light switching on, and then something tells uh, psi n to push the, the orbit closer, a little bit closer to the origin, and then again, rotation. So uh, this will be the mechanism. And crucial is an avatar of a coupling lemma initially due to Michel Hermann. See, I said at the beginning that uh, the central thread of all these papers is this idea of using Gevray regularity. So you have features pertaining to analysis, you mean exponentially, exponential stability, etc. And you have features which are definitely uh, smooth but not analytic which allow you to use this um, synchronized diffusion mechanism. So the heart of that Hermann's mechanism is a coupling lemma. And in our paper, you find it at the very beginning, and it's quite simple. So let me try to be technical for one minute. So I'm trying to explain the form the coupling lemma uh, takes in our paper. So... Uh, you remember, um, we very much think of um, uh, the phase space as a product. Uh, so let's say we are in R6, we have three copies of R2. And the game consists in using uh, products, Cartesian products, and then you have a slight coupling. So this is a coupling lemma of the three factors. And in this first stage, we have only two factors playing a role. So first, because alpha is larger than one, we can use bum functions, you know, a, a function with a shape of a bell. Uh, you fix uh, z in the plane, and u very small, and you can find a function which is supported only near z. So the function is equal to one in the neighborhood of z, and identically zero outside a larger neighborhood of z. So this is the important thing. Uh, the, the support is uh, contained in the ball of radius nu centered at z. Of course, such a function, if nu is very small, there is a price to pay for this uh, very uh, tight bump. The price to pay is that its Gevray norm is exponentially large when nu is small. But well, that's life. It's, uh, it's necessary. It's like this. So that will be on one factor. And on another factor, we will use the function x times y, the product of the coordinates. So this is, let's say, a factor, the second factor. R2, we have x, y, and then again, we cut, we cut off uh, outside um, a rectangle. It's zero. So let's say it's x, y when you are in a um, square of, uh, I mean, minus 2r, 2r times itself. Uh, then you have exactly x, y. And when you are farther, uh, you have nothing. So you have these two functions. And then this is the, the beauty. You consider the Hamiltonian function, which is written here. So it is uh, this exponentially small quantity, which will fight, which will um, fight the exponentially large norm of f. So there is an exponentially small number, because there is a minus here, and here there was a plus. 
And there is this um, tensor product, which means that you use F on the ith coordinate and you use G on the jth coordinate. So we this way we define in practice, we use three maps, phi 2, 1, phi 1, 3, or phi 3, 2. So here I give the example of phi 2, 1. So this means I'm using a small number times F of the second coordinate, S2, times G of the first coordinate, S1. Um, so this is a Hamiltonian function which happens to be Gevray. So it's time one map, which is well defined. It's a global symplectomorphism. It is Gevray alpha. And it has its support uh, very well, very easy to identify. And moreover, you can do the analysis. Uh, the, this symplectomorphism, the time one map, very strong exponential. This is really, really exponentially small. And so it, it uh, crushes the exponentially large character of F. So in the end, this map is very, and beautiful idea is that it's very easy to compute the flow of a Hamiltonian function defined as a tensor product on different factors. I mean, you can check this formula. So, phi, I mean, this notation phi exponential means, uh, phi with an exponent means the flow at time one of the function, which is here. You can, of course, you can insert a constant here if you wish. Uh, so what is the flow of uh, such a product Hamiltonian? On the first factor, you use the first function with a time which is given by the second function. And on the second factor, you use the flow of the second function. Nice formula, which allow you to prove this technical lemma. Um, let me take it here. Yes. Um, so, Z and Z should be Z uh, two. It's on the second factor because it's F two one. Yes, it's tensor product two one. So F on the second coordinate. So F is concentrated near Z. So if the second coordinate is too far from Z, then nothing happens because you are out of the outside the, the support of F. So you are outside the support of the product. This is item A. Item B, if now the, your first coordinate happens to be on the X1 axis, X1 axis for the first coordinate, then you stay on the x1 axis and nothing happens to this to other two variables this is because what's happening on the first variable is the flow of g but g is this super elementary function x times y so x times y you can compute the flow and you see that uh, the the x1 axis is invariant so and moreover you can check that the flow is going always in the same direction so you will go closer to the origin. Maybe you don't move at all. Maybe S2 was not in the support. So maybe you don't change, but maybe S2 was in the support. And in that case, you may gain something. And if S2 is close enough, new over two close to the Z, then yes, you gain definitely something because there is a factor kappa, which is less than one. That's the important thing. Kappa is definitely less than one. Admittedly, Kappa is very close to one. You don't gain much each time, but we will use that infinitely many times, of course. So this is a very, very easy lemma to prove. And this is, I would say, the, the remnant of Hermann's ID in the present context. Now, what do we do with this lemma? Um, 
a map like Phi21. So we have at our disposal, we have Phi21, Phi13, and Phi32. So we will use Phi21 to push down close to the origin the first variable. So Phi21 means that second coordinate will push the first coordinate closer to the origin. Phi13 is the first coordinate which pushes the third coordinate closer to the origin. This is the idea. So a map like phi21, if you use for the function f, you use a point z2 and a, a small neighborhood with size nu2. So it pre preserves the x1 axis on the first um, coordinate and pushes down orbits toward the origin along this axis while keeping the other two variables frozen. That was item B. However, when the second variable is in the appropriate ball, then really the map will effectively bring down the x1 axis toward the origin with a gain kappa less than one. And moreover, if uh, we are far from the activating ball, b, z2, mu2, then nothing happens. So the idea is that we have here an elevator, but it's a very peculiar elevator. It never goes up and sometimes it really goes down. So that is the idea, it's the elevator on the one, x1 one axis. Of course, if your S1 is elsewhere, you don't know what happens, but you don't care because you will use periodicity synchronization to go back to the x1 axis and then you will observe what happens. So this elevator never goes up and effectively goes down along the x1 axis when the second variable is in this activating ball, which is, uh, yes, there is a factor two. I mean, you need to be close enough to uh, Z2 would be the name, the appropriate name, because uh, this function F is in the second factor. But of course, we will alternate. We have elevator of phi 2, 1, but we have phi 3, 2, phi 1, 3. So the proof of our theorem uses longer and longer compositions of regularly alternating elevators, elevators that go down, um, with uh, followed by periodic rotations. And we need that periodicity to go back to the x1 axis or the x2 axis or the x3 axis in order to have our um, attracting scheme working. So here are some explanations. It becomes more technical, obviously. Uh, if uh, Z2 is inside the activating ball, well, well, you can try to follow this maybe. Imagine Z2 is in the activating ball for Phi21. So Phi21 is actively pushing down Z1 on the X1 axis. But simultaneously, there is Phi32 acting on Z2. So at some point, Z2 will exit the activating ball because it has gone uh, along its own X2 axis. It has gone closer to the origin, so it has left it has exited the activated activating ball. So now, now this guy becomes inactive, the elevator doesn't move. But, uh, so the vi variable Z1 stops its descent, but it will still rotate. We still have uh, our uh, periodic rotation. And now, now phi13 can be used. Maybe it will become active because Z1 is just at the appropriate height, and then we can use it to push down Z3. And as Z3 goes down, Phi32 will become again inactive and Z2 will only rotate, etc., etc. So this is the idea, an alternating procedure of the three types of elevators. Uh, here is the kind of technical intermediary result we need. I mean, I'm trying to give you the rough idea, but you have to get your hands a little bit dirty. But everything is written in the paper. It's not very long. It's 20 pages. Uh, but here you see the frequency vector at some point, omega. So what is the, the idea here? Uh, you have a rational frequency vector, omega. And moreover, uh, Q2 is the period because Q2 is a multiple of Q1, which is a multiple of Q3. And in that order, because here we are interested very interested in, in that composition in that order. You see the map here, I mean, phi two, I mean, with the, the, the periodic rotation and then phi two one, 
and then phi three two, uh, and then phi one three, and then again phi two one, but with different points. You know, uh, the the point the, after the indices, you have the location of the point for the support of the function f. When I say just x two, I mean it means x two zero. It means I mean we are very interested in x axis in this story. Okay, so you start with omega and with z all components on the x-axis. And then we find omega bar, z bar, z prime. So the idea is that z prime, you see z prime is close to z. So in fact, after all, z was not the initial co condition. The initial condition will be z prime, but it's arbitrarily close to z. And you land after n iterates of that map, n will be very large, you land at z bar, and z bar you see on the x-axis, every component on the x-axis, but you have divided by a factor two each component. You have, get, you have gotten closer to the origin. And then you want to iterate that idea. So I repeat, you start with omega and z, z on the product of the axis, and you replace z by a nearby initial condition, z prime, and you land after n iterates of that complicated map, you land on z bar, which is again on the product of the axis uh, and definitely closer to the origin. And of course, I forgot to say, but I changed the frequency vector. I replaced it by omega bar, which is of the same form as previously. Omega bar is rational and the periods are just greater. So even to prove that it's not trivial, you use in a clever way the previous lemma and with that intermediary result, you can prove something else. And uh, well, it, it becomes very technical. You can refer to the article to see the full construction. Thank you all for your attention and obrigado e de beijo. Thank you, Davi. Obrigado, Davi. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Davi, for the nice presentation. Um, I guess quite interesting. Um, are there any questions for David? Uh, hi, David. Uh, I have a, a few questions. Uh, can, can this be, uh, can you modify Duarte's result uh, to, uh, to have the same result as yours? Uh, Rafael Duarte's uh, 88 uh, result. Can you modify that to get uh, a uh, orbit which is asymptotic to the, uh, the fixed point? Can you repeat the question? I missed the, the beginning. Can you speak slightly okay. louder? So, can you modify uh, Rafael Duarte's uh, 88 uh, result to obtain uh, uh, orbit which is asymptotic to the uh, fixed point? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let me think. In in the case of Raphael Duadi, his construction. Uh, how was it? It's very they much have, similar. Yeah, they have pieces of of it which travel right. uh, closer and well. Away, I mean, he's going the other way, so he's going away from the origin. Right. And he's following matter. simple resonances. So he's following simple resonances for pieces of orbits which come from closer and closer to the origin. Right. Yeah, that would be quite natural. Uh, I think we tried that a little bit initially and we didn't succeed. It. And in, in the end, it was easier for us to adapt our techniques. I mean, adapt. Right. I mean, really, these papers are not duplicate one of the other. Each time we right. are doing quite different things, but the philosophy of 
Hermann was really to have a fine-tuned synchronization. But well, that was uh, Bassam's input in that paper was very interesting because he he taught us how to allow for uh, you know a C zero modification of the map, a C zero modification of the initial condition, and then you lose a bit of control, but you still know what you are doing. Yeah. This is the way we were coming from that world, and it would be difficult for us to to okay. really um, to really modify do at this original construction. So the answer so is, is okay. okay. So is this why you need a six dimensions instead of a four? Um, yes, yes, it's that's a good remark because um, with Localves they were doing things in in only four dimension, and we could not. We could not because we had these ideas of elevators and you use one variable to push the other, but somehow uh, with only two two factors, we couldn't do it because uh, somebody okay. else yeah. has to intervene. So indeed, our method fails with, uh, I mean, we don't know how to make it. And in, in on the contrary, in Duadi Localvez paper, they have only four dimensions. So maybe we should look at that, yeah, look at that. Yeah, because moreover, Bassam's recent paper has Yapunov instability, not asymptotic orbits, but also he has trouble with low dimension. I noticed that. Uh, does okay. So the, the follow-up question: Does so your work actually implies uh, if you try to make into analytic uh, perturbation? So the, basically, that you, you might not get uh, the asymptotic property, but naturally get the instability, the output of instability. You basically yeah. need to do uh, steps and uh, let it converge to some analytic function. Because each step, you can make it analytic. Each mm, of probably. The uh, yeah, but I mean, we would an be able to, to, to ensure convergence in the analytic category, we would be in trouble, I suppose. But well, uh, it's not this, it's not hopeless. It's reasonable. As right, far as I right. know, this is not Bassam's approach. Bassam's recent paper, he has other ideas. I mean, he's he says in his paper he's using a bit of that philosophy, but he's using also other uh, ingredients in his uh, new mechanism. Uh, I'm personally, my experience with analytic uh, examples is that well, it's. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's true. Right. I mean, Jean Marco also, uh, we had done our Gevray paper based on Hermann's idea. And a bit later with Pierre Lochac, he managed to make it analytic. So yes, all hopes are permitted. Right, I, I mean that you, this paper, your, your work probably already implied that uh, analytic function works, but they just weaken uh, the conclusion. It just weaken the conclusion. You don't get, uh, Asymptotic properties, but they do get uh, the up of uh, instability. You claim that we have it for free. You pay almost. Almost. Ah. I mean, do you claim right. that because there is it, automatic, or do, you, or do you imagine that with appropriate extra work right. we can do it? Right, because you already have uh, outside. You already have this uh, orbit coming in, and each step you try to connect them, but connecting all of them. You uh, for an analytic map that's not almost not it's very unlikely. I mean it's very hard, but you just uh, intersecting the properties. You probably already have it. Well, I I take your word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, you already probably that um, <laughs> you already get it, but but just weakening the uh, conclusion a little bit. The other okay, yeah, I, I get it. I get. Of, uh, yeah, okay. That, it that's... is the of instability, but not asymptotic. Exactly. Function. But then yeah. for analytic okay. functions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. The question uh, I have is that uh, is uh, a Gilbury uh, a bare space? The functional space of a Gilbury is it a bare space? Uh... I suppose so, yeah. So uh, see if it is, but <laughs> any different case not. Let me think. Um, <laughs> um, well, let me think about it a while. I mean, I'm, 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 I'll say something stupid. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to think about it again. Uh, 
it must be e the answer must be easy but i for some reason i can't figure out right now yeah uh, the, the reason i'm asking this question is that uh, uh if it is bare space can you say it's a generic property or dense property in this case so what do you have constructed I think it's a bad place because, I mean, for all purposes and intents, uh, uh, Gevray functions behave like smooth function, like CK function. It's like, uh, they definitely resemble more uh, smooth category rather than analytic category. So this is why I think it's bare. But the question you ask is, is a different, of a different nature. Uh, I have no experience with genericity. Uh, and of oh, course... Oh. Oh, he's a That's dance. the same question with Arnold Diffusion, and it's a big question. Uh, I have no idea. But but it seems you have proved it's dance. It's a dance. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow, again, uh, we have done more than we thought. Then uh, Yes, that's great. <laughs> uh, no, maybe we you? should get uh, more seriously then, because uh, you think uh, we get it for almost free? Uh, no, it, again, it's the same thing. If it is dense, yeah. then you don't get the asymptotic. If you take the limit, you may not get the asymptotic property, but it, again, you get uh, the upper of instability. Yeah, we would get, um, let's say, Lyapunov instability is but general. But not asymptotic property. Yeah. Which would be already something as far as I know. Yeah, it's already <laughs> something. I, I think you have done far <laughs> more than what you have claimed. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's, I mean, let's um, keep in touch, please. <laughs> okay. All right, that's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's really an important and interesting problem. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we <laughs> reacted this way. All right, very nice uh, interaction. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Okay, well, then I guess we can thank uh, David again for the very interesting talk. And, uh, and thank Jeff also for the interesting comments <laughs> uh, and questions. And uh, I'll pass the word to Annette and Marcelo. We can hear you. The noisy. Yeah, it's very noisy. Very well. We have so many microphones open. I closed it. Some microphones. Could you hear me now? Better? Yeah. 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 So we are to stop to record it. So if you want to open.